Good morning and welcome to Making Peace with Money with your host, Laurie Lomantia, Professor, CPO and Prosperity Coach. Get ready to master your life and your money, not the other way around. Now, here is your host, Laurie Lamontia. Good morning and welcome to Making Peace with Money, where I am talking to Lori Gaspar, our guest today, and I've invited Lori to talk with us to talk about being a, what I call a Chief Prosperity Officer. I think Lori's done a beautiful job of creating her business to be very prosperous and to be very generous. And so I've asked Lori to share with her us her experience and her understanding of what she intended for creating her, her business, which is Prairie Yoga. And Prairie Yoga is actually, their website is prairieyoga.org, and it's a teacher training facility and center that provides 200-level and 500-level teacher training, which I'm sure Lori will tell you about. So it's in our community, it's very well known as providing a, a wonderful service and a wonderful community. And Lori has done what I consider a beautiful job of creating this business. And so I thought, why? how better to find out about the intentions of a chief prosperity officer than to have one on. So, Lori, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Oh, well, thank you for inviting me, Lori. This is exciting because I, I, I don't know. Did you ever consider yourself a chief prosperity officer? No, but I like that title. I like it. You know, I, I talk to CFOs. See, you know, a new one is a chief technology officer I've run into, but I kind of like chief prosperity officer. I'll take that title. Yeah, thank you. Well, you know, it's funny because when we do start our businesses, we get so ingrained in the feeling of I got to do the business, I got to make it happen, you know, that left brain thing. But to me, the chief prosperity officer title opens up heart and it brings us into that creative side, which I think you've done such a wonderful job with Prairie Yoga. Go with. Yeah. I have to keep, I like that title. I'm writing it down because it is challenging when you open your business to, to not get focused on all the left brain stuff because that's the stuff that's right in your face that needs done right away, but then you can lose sight of the bigger picture. Absolutely. And so what was your intention when you started Prairie Yoga? Well, I started Prairie Yoga a few years ago as a teacher training school. I had worked for uh, one of the largest yoga studios in the, or yoga centers in the Midwest area um, as one of their teacher trainers or assistant teacher trainer. And when I, over the years, as we saw, as we were training teachers to be, you know, to teach yoga, I saw this need to, for the teachers to have additional training, mostly to modify the yoga practice for people who might not be able to come to your everyday yoga class. They have some kind of either uh, a chronic medical condition or just your everyday person who has, you know, uh, knee issues, low back issues, that type of thing. And I just felt there was a huge need that wasn't being met, um, that teachers needed more training to adapt the practice. So at the time, the facility I was working for wasn't interested in developing the, uh, a more advanced training. So that's when I left the, that school and started my own school, which was Prairie Yoga. Which is, just as a side note, an excellent point for future entrepreneurs. Things to look for is there's a need. There's an unmet need in the environment and the community that you think you can fill. Yeah. It's kind of really important and fundamental. So that so did you have an intention for the business? So I'm hearing this intention for, well, this is the service I'm going to provide. Did you have an intention for the kind of business you wanted to create? Um, in ter- well, once I started the teacher training programs, it really was, um, you know, it was basically me teaching them. Mm-hmm. And then I had, fortunately, I had a community that really supported me. So I had some people that wanted to continue to learn and be involved in the program. And so they mentored, and, and I had, you know, additional help there. And it kind of just sort of mushroomed on its own as uh, the demand for teacher trainings or as I was getting more people signing up for our teacher training more people became involved in the business. So a significant shift happened when I've opened. We were in business for a few years, and what we would do is we'd go to other yoga studios and use pay rent to use their facilities 
um, to do teacher trainings, and I was uh, one of the primary teacher trainers, and then uh, one of my colleagues, Trisha Fisk, came on board with me um, to train yoga teachers as well. So we were traveling around at the different yoga studios, and it just got to be where uh, we needed our own space. So I decided to rent a space that we would have a home for our teacher training programs and we wouldn't be traveling around locally so much. So when I developed or decided to open the space for the teacher training programs, we only needed that. We only needed the space a day or, you know, a couple days a week, but we needed to, to kind of support our teacher trainings with classes and with elective workshops. So that's basically when I expanded the business into becoming a yoga center. So I moved from being just a teacher training school into a yoga center. And most yoga centers do the opposite. They're yoga studios first, and then they add teacher training programs. So one of the benefits of that, it wasn't really intentional as much as how it, how it evolved, was I had an existing community. From having all these teacher training programs, we had built this very large kind of community that really had no home, that was floating in space. Um, so when I opened the studio, you know, it gave us a foundation and a place for classes and workshops and to do our teacher training programs. But um, go ahead. So do you feel like is that when it took a different energetic turn, so to speak? Uh, yeah, it did. Um, then it became, I really, that's when I really sat down. Like originally when I created the business, the teacher training school, I really was focusing on an unmet need and how to serve that need. And it was less about a bigger business plan. Mm -hmm. Um, Now it's become, now that we have a yoga center, I have to be very mindful of how I approach the yoga center because there are other yoga studios in the area. There's also, um, you know, people go to yoga classes at health clubs and community centers and I really have to think, well, what makes us different? Why would anybody want to come to our yoga center? And how can I continue to keep my focus on, really, it's also been, you know, really high-quality teacher training programs that we offer. And so I need to continue that really high-quality teaching into our yoga classes. Um, so that's been, you know, I, I've got to keep my eye on that all the time because it's kind of easy to get kind of like, well, do what everybody else is doing, but I don't want to do what everybody else is doing in terms of yoga studios. Um, One of the approaches I've taken is I have most of our teachers, not all of them, but have had 500-hour training. So they've had additional training. They've had the advanced training, and I want to keep those teachers, the more advanced teachers, as part of our faculty, our primary faculty so that when you come to our yoga center, you're kind of getting a, you know, a more experienced teacher teaching you who can modify the practice. So how did your business philosophy evolve when you set yourself up in a physical space? Well, I just thought I had worked at many yoga studios and, and had worked for you know, uh, a yoga studio, and, and some of it I, I kind of learned over the years what I felt worked well and what didn't. And some of the things I wanted to change and become part of our philosophy is I always sort of felt that yoga teachers aren't supported real well, either financially, um, and they're kind of independent on their own. You know, they come in, they teach, and they leave. And in our teacher training programs, I've always really focused on building a community and a supportive structure for teachers so that they have other peers they can, um, you know, rely on and, and as a support system. And I want to continue that in the yoga center. So one of the ways I'm doing that is I always felt it was unfair that yoga teachers, most yoga studios pay their teachers based on the number of students that attend the class. Um, So say five students come to a class, one person's class, and 15 come to another person's class. Does that, so if you're paid per student, the, the teacher that had 15 students is paid three times as much as the teacher that is paid that has five students, and I always felt that that really doesn't reflect the value of those teachers. The teacher that might only have five students might be teaching a class that's just not as a at a popular time, or they might be teaching a smaller population of students that have greater needs. That so it's actually harder to teach them, and yet they'll make and they're making significantly less. And then the teacher that's teaching those 
15 students, they might just happen to have a really great time slot. Right. And I always thought that was way out of balance, that um, to, to pay one teacher three times more than another or even more than that sometimes or um, it just doesn't make any sense if you value all your teachers. So what, what I did is I flattened that out, and I felt like I've hired, or everyone that works at Prairie Yoga are, are great teachers. You know, I personally selected them as teachers that I thought were really strong teachers with a lot of experience and a lot of advanced training. So I felt that they should all be paid fairly, and the best way to do that was if we're all paid equally. So because so that the studio can survive, I can't just throw out a number and say, oh, I'm going to pay everybody X amount per class because I don't know how much revenue is going to come in that month. So what we decided to do, and I talked with the teachers as a group, we had a group meeting at what we felt was fair, was that the teachers, we'd pool all the money, all the revenue that came in that month for the studio, for those for specific classes. And the teachers would sh- would get a percentage and the studio would keep a percentage. And so the teachers all split equally that percentage of the revenue. So all the teachers are paid the same, and it's based on the revenue that comes in. So it, that structure creates a couple things. It creates a cooperative environment for the teachers. If one teacher recommends a student to another teacher's class, we all benefit from that. Uh, where the structure now it, in, in many studios are, is if a teacher were to refer a student to another teacher's class, they lose that income because the, te- the student's leaving their class. So that's one thing, that they, if everybody gets paid, and if we all recommend classes, we all benefit no matter whose class the student attends. Um, then the teachers aren't really competing with each other at all. I I think this is so brilliant um, on so many levels, and we're headed into a break, but I really want to talk about this because there's so many, in that one thing that you did, which is paradigm shifting, it's symbolic because it's sending a message to the whole community. It's creating a different kind of environment, um, and it's really bringing forward your learnings from the past. You're doing so much in that one thing that is setting the tone, which I think is so much about what a chief prosperity officer does and you're doing it intuitively and so I really want to talk about that a little bit more because I think it's really important for people to think and feel and notice how that intuitive I want to try that is going to set a different kind of stage and a different tone in the company Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, stick with us and we'll be back after the break Welcome back to Making Peace with Money, and we're talking with Lori Gaspar from Prairie Yoga, and their website is prairieyoga.org, and Lori is the founder of the organization, and she's also a, a major contributor as a teacher, and before the break, we were talking about how she created and utilized a different compensation structure for the for the company so that it would foster a different kind of environment. And so, Lori, by switching the compensation from individual teachers just getting paid for their class to the overall studio, whatever the studio's take is, and dividing it equally, how do you think that's worked out? What's the feedback from the teachers? Um, I think it was a really wise decision. The feedback I get from the teachers, um, they have a tremendous sense of camaraderie, and they feel like they're part of the studio. Um, I often get, you know, I had one of my teachers said to me recently, you know, she's like, you know, well, we, they feel like they're all in this together, and they know that the studio's new, and um, I keep them fully informed of everything that's going on. So that they, um, they they get a good feel for the compensation and and you know and the numbers that are coming in, why they're being paid what they are. But overall, it has it has created a tremendous sense of camaraderie that I haven't felt necessarily anywhere else. And the teachers clearly communicate it. They really feel like I feel like basically that we're all in this together. That's the feeling that I get, and that's the communication I get from them. And so I think, you know, as the studio builds and if we have wanes, you know, rises and falls in revenue, um, it's going to be more understanding with the teachers. They understand why it's doing that. 
You know, and it's so, it, it's, to me, this is so important because one symbolic event like this, it's not only symbolic, but it's actually strategic, the choice to compensate in, in such a pooled manner is creating unity. And that's what I think a chief prosperity officer does. You're doing it intuitively and organically. But I think that's what we do naturally is we're looking for that all for one and one for all kind of we're in this together and you know it's the three musketeer model um one and everyone sinks and comes together or swims together well you know you often hear you know people say well we're all in this together and you know you can use words to say that but you really actions are the most effective way absolutely do things that show we're all in this together so that we're all rewarded. Everyone is, and I pay myself as well out of that uh, revenue pool for my classes. So, um, you know, we are, and I think that also sends a message. I'm not different. I'm one of the teachers there, and I'm, I'm at the same level as everybody else. Even though I'm running the studio, I'm, I have great teachers, and I don't feel like I'm, I'm above them in any way. Absolutely. And, and that's one of the things, too, is that not only are you sending a symbolic message, but you're putting it in action. Mm-hmm. And for companies that really want to foster prosperity and foster unity, you found a really unique way to, to send that message and to cultivate that, that interconnectivity. Mm-hmm. So I, I really congratulate you because it was brilliant. And the other point I thought was really powerful is that you took what worked in other environments and you brought forward what worked, but you also let go of what didn't work and you changed it. I think a lot of people don't realize how important it is when they go out and start their own business to start with their what they really want to experience instead of just bringing forward all the stuff that they saw other people do. Yeah, and that's it's you have to have courage to do that because the even in yoga is a very traditional system and there's a lot of tradition, you know, it's things that are ingrained in the system and pe- and studios and teaching teachers do things because that's what they were taught. It's really as I, um, I would describe it, it's a top-down approach to things. There's a teacher, you know, when you first enter into yoga, you have a teacher and you're a student, and the teacher is looked up to and revered on as like almost all-powerful, all-wisdom. And, and that carries through also into yoga studios and how also in yoga businesses themselves, we have this top-down approach where there's, you know, one guru or one top teacher who is really leading everything and everybody else is sort of under them. You know, they're learning from them or, or they work for them. And I also, I wanted to take a different approach. Um, I think a more, and that system, by the way, is rooted in the, you know, from India, it's been that way for thousands of years, how yoga was taught. But when I look at, at America and entrepreneurship and, and things that made, you know, makes America great is we sort of, um, you know, we're a little bit more individualized, but we, we aren't so, you know, if you look at management structures, we really kind of almost discourage too much of a top-down structure. Most, most organizations now, businesses, look more, are a flatter structure, you know, where, and so I see my role as completely opposite of the top-down approach. I want to be I want to support my teachers and our students from underneath our teacher training programs. Uh, so I want to create this structure, an underlying structure that supports their work, but let them fly, let them be free to, um, to grow and explore as a teacher. And so instead of feeling like they work for me, I almost feel like I want to work for them. How can I support them? How can, how can I create an environment where we can develop really great teachers and they can grow and blossom and they have freedom? So why would they want to work anywhere else? Right, which is brilliant, again, because you're realizing that that environment, which is, to me, the glue, it's like the the underlying seedbed. If the seedbed is rotten, there's not going to be a lot flourishing, and that environment is what allows that collaboration and and, and co co-creation to happen. Mm -hmm. So using yourself, like you said, not as the guru who's right in the center, but the person who's facilitating the environment, that shifts the whole game right there. And it's not very, 
you know, it's not that common in yoga. Like I said, yoga is very traditional, and, you know, most yoga studios and most yoga businesses pattern themselves pretty consistently on what their teacher did or what the business they work for. Um, there's not uh, a tremendous amount of innovation, I would say, within the yoga businesses, at least that I see. Um, it's like some, a teacher works for a studio, and then they decide to open a studio, so they basically do the same thing everybody else is doing because they don't really see another way. Um, and it takes courage to, to do something to do, do something different. And um, at first I wasn't sure, especially with the way I was going to pay teachers or I wanted to pay teachers, I wasn't sure how it would be embraced. So before I made the ultimate decision to for sure do that, I did, you know, I, I asked for their input. And I also asked for their input on uh, we have some benefits such as, um, you know, we wanted to be able to give the teachers free classes, but if there's... If teachers are always going to sell all free classes, there's not a lot of revenue in this, you know, being created in the studio if they just have unlimited classes. So the teachers as a group decided, well, let's have, if you teach one class at the studio per week, you get one free class a week then. And if you teach three classes a week, then you should get three free classes a week. So, again, I, I like, brought them in as part of the decision-making process so that we could decide you know, how the benefits of the studio would be, you know, that, that, I, that I would be providing. And I think that's another excellent point. This is so fun because, you know, it's a famous line I've heard before is one of us is not as smart as all of us. Yeah, and it's true. by engaging everybody, you're getting that wisdom of the group. Yeah. You know, I serve on a school board as well, and one of the school board workshops um, that was held by, like, a facilitator, like, to get the board to work together was exactly that exercise where we did an exercise. We answered questions um, individually, like 10 questions individually, and then we did a group. Then we collected all our responses and decided as a group what was the better answer, and then we compared them to what the real answers were, and we saw that as a group we were stronger than the decisions that were made individually. Um, and, I, and I remember that lesson very well. But as a group, we will make better decisions. And so I want to carry that through with the, the yoga studio. The decisions I make, I want to keep the teachers part of. Also, that sends a message to them that I'm going to continue. We are a community. We are collaborating together. It's just not Lori running the show. You know? Right. And, that's, and like you said, it's very courageous, especially for entrepreneurs, cause a lot of, because you have so much at stake. You have put a lot of probably your risk capital in. You've put a lot of your time. I think it's, it's very courageous for an entrepreneur, which I'll call a CPO, to take that leap of faith to believe that the group has a, this wisdom that might be more... Um, more wise than their individual wisdom. Mm -hmm. And so it takes a tremendous amount of courage to let that happen, to ask for that feedback, to engage people in that way, and to really accept, well, you know, that might be the way to go. This might, it it, it might not be my way, but it's our way. And a lot of times that's what creates the cohesion and the commitment that you could never create if you had a top down. Right. Well, another thing I've done that along those lines is we recently sent out a class schedule survey to all of everyone on our email list, our students, and we've asked them what class times we prefer, how long do they like classes, you know, what types of uh, classes are they looking for, et cetera. And it was so funny because I, we got an overwhelming response. And some of the things that you think you know as an individual, as a teacher, based on your own experience, we found out other things from the survey. Um, so it was interesting to, like, literally, I've, I'm asking my teachers for their input, but why not also ask the students, you know, yeah, wow, the customer. The, the customer. <laughs> like, customer. And, and one of my teachers was laughing. She goes, Lori, how revolutionary. You're actually, you're actually asking students what they want. You know, <laughs> why haven't we done this before, you know, type of thing. But to keep, and, and you want the students to feel that way, too, that they're part of a community. It's not just us teachers teaching them, they're also part of our community uh, here at Prairie Yoga. And, you know, and, and you're pointing out a really, I think, a powerful 
business notion for all people going forward. It is in these communities that we're going to create resilience and strength together. And it's the one, it's the businesses that are an island that have no relationship with their customer and with their employee that are going to find it even harder when times get tough. Because one of the things I've seen is that you need that co-creative energy to weather some storms, which we're right in the middle of. And when you have that, you can you can forge forward where other businesses just end up melting down because they don't have that internal power base. Yeah, and it can get pretty lonely making all the decisions oh, by yourself. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it really can. It can be kind of isolating. So... Um, we're gonna we're moving into a break now, and what well, what I'd like to talk about after the break is money. I would like to talk about how you're making real money being a yoga teacher, because I think the belief is, well, I couldn't possibly make a living being you know doing what I love, especially yoga. Mm-hmm. So I would love to talk about that after the break with you. Okay, great. Thank you. Welcome back, and we're visiting with Lori Gaspar, who is the entrepreneur who started prairieyoga.org right here in Illinois, in Glen Ellen, and she has created a beautiful community of yoga teachers and students who attend her classes and attend the classes of the this the the center while taking teacher training also. And one of the things that has fascinated me about this in your story, Lori, is that you are actually making money in an industry that seems to think, well, I can't be do what I love and make money, and I certainly can't make money as a yoga teacher. It's something I do as my uh, you know, community service, but I couldn't actually quit my job and be a yoga teacher. And you're doing it. And I find that fascinating. So how is it that you're doing it? <laughs> well, one of them, again, we're going to go back to courage. And one of the things is having the courage to ask, actually ask people to pay you what you think you're worth. Uh-huh. Um, you know, one of the things we run into a lot in yoga is people, it is a it is a spiritual path. Definitely yoga is a spiritual path. And so along with that, there is some feeling, well, you should give that away. Um, but yoga teachers spend a tremendous amount of time and money on their training. And most yoga teachers are really dedicated and are, have ongoing training. And they need to value the time and uh, money and their wisdom that they have. And if they don't value it, um, the students won't value it or the community won't value it. So number one, it's, it's really having the courage to say, hey, I am worth X amount of money, whatever that is. Uh, you know, a lot of yoga teachers, like, they'll teach, you know, they'll, students will ask them for private lessons, and they're afraid to charge them adequately for their time. And so when we do our teacher training programs, you know, one of our, we, on one of the days we always talk about how to charge for yoga. And my constant message to our trainees is, you know, have a base figure. Can you call, who can you call into your home or have a whole hour private session with, uh, say, a massage therapist or even calling a plumber to your house? You know, think about how much you pay them. Aren't you worth as much as them? Haven't you had as much study as they have in your wisdom? Aren't you giving a benefit that's just as valuable? So number one, it's having the courage to, like, to actually go out and ask for the amount of money that, that you're worth. And, again, we're, you know, we have a hesitancy, especially also there's the also issue is there's so many women in, yo- in yoga and traditionally women stu- in women's fields, women tend not to make as much money. Do you think, what do you think the underlying belief is about money and charging for spiritual practice? Well, I think, you know, again, we'll go back to India. In, yoga is rooted in India. And in India, spiritual, um, you know, students and leaders are highly respected to kind of cast off your daily life and to, you know, almost become like a beggar. There are many in, in India. is almost revered and looked up to, like, oh, that person is really following a spiritual path and many, the community will support that person, will, you know, feed them, clothe them, um, give them money, that type of thing. But so when you carry yoga back into America, 
some of that comes with, like it's a spiritual teaching, and you shouldn't be asking money, you know. Uh, but in America, we do not look up to beggars. You know, we look down at beggars. Uh, we don't necessarily look up to people who have cast aside a different profession so that they could just follow a spiritual path. So, uh, you know, we need to take a different approach. We need, you know, th- there's that hesitancy, oh, it's spiritual. I ran into this also when I was a graphic designer before I was a um, yoga teacher. And there was some of this a little bit in, like, the art community, like in graphic design, like, oh, you're doing something you love, therefore you shouldn't have to get paid for it. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and your friends and family want you to do everything for you for free. And I see that a little bit also in yoga, like, oh, you love yoga, therefore you shouldn't have to, you know, we shouldn't have to pay you for it. Like, just teaching it is compensation enough. But yet, you know, yoga teachers have bills to pay, they have families to feed, they have health insurance to buy, and shouldn't they be entitled to a decent living as much as anybody else? Um, so I think we have to switch gears a little bit. Like, it is a spiritual path, yes, but there's not a church or a synagogue. There's nothing to support the yoga teacher financially, like there is if you were a priest or a minister, for instance, you know, where people would tithe things. We don't have that here in America. We don't have a financial support structure for yoga teachers. So we have to follow a different path. We, you know, it has to be more of a a business path. We, we're providing, yes, a spiritual and physical uh, benefit to people, but we can't follow a religious, I guess you can't follow the religious path, you know, of how they support their religious leaders. Right. And, and this, to me, is a perfect opportunity to disconnect the, I feel like, the unquestioned belief that money is bad, or there's something dirty about money, and so you shouldn't charge money for providing a a beautiful spiritual service. And it seems to me that money is a way for us to say thank you for providing that beautiful service. It's a way for us to share um, something that we have for something, a gift that somebody gave us. Right. You know, it's, it's, it to me, an unwillingness to charge is an unwillingness to sit, allow the grace of somebody to say, thank you, I appreciate what you've done. And, you know, we've still got a lot of baggage around money, obviously. And what you're saying, I hope Pete, the listeners are really, you know, letting sink in that it's an opportunity to disconnect that belief that money's bad and if you're doing something good, you shouldn't get compensated. Yeah. You know, money... It- it gives you power, and power's not all bad. I mean, it gives you the power to give to, um, you know, um, charities that you believe in or give to, you know, support your child to, so they can go to college, you know. It, it, it's not a bad thing. Money's not. In fact, and I'm going back to India and in the Hindu tradition, one of the four goals of ha- human aspiration is called artha, and it is the pursuit of wealth that, you know, even in India, the recognition that, you have to pursue wealth, be able to give and support your family or give to others. And I also have one of our teachers, one of my favorite uh, teachers, and one of my favorite sayings is, he says, if you want to help poor people, the best thing is not to become one yourself. (laughs) I love that. And it's true. You know, if you want to help other people, uh, don't become, don't lower yourself down. Rise above so that you have enough money to have, because money gives you freedom, and it, you know, it gives you freedom to be, make choices. And if you don't earn enough money, you're very limited in what you can do, and that makes means that you're very limited in how you can help others. You know, if I made enough money that I could open the studio, and I didn't have to, you know, scrape it all together. I, I had worked for a few years and took that money from the teacher trainees. I opened the studio, and so now I'm even serving a greater community because I accumulated that wealth. You seem to not have a discomfort with money. So you, do you feel like you've never had a problem with thinking yoga, you could make a living doing yoga? Um, no, I never thought, like I never pursued yoga. Like I taught yoga because I loved it, yes, but I also did value my time. And so I wasn't afraid from early on to charge for private lessons or to work for places that could pay more money. Um, than other places, and then you'd balance that. Then I, I would balance it because, for instance, I was teaching at um, College of Page for many years, 
and in the physical education department, we were teaching yoga, and it, you're paid fairly well there. And then I was asked to teach for the Older Adult Institute, the seniors, and you're paid about half as much for the, in the Older Adult Institute. But I thought, well, I'm serving this community. I'm not being paid. I'm get, getting paid more in this area, and that way I can serve an area that maybe can't afford it as much. Mm-hmm. And I also feel that in, in the, do that in our yoga studio. Like, you know, we need to try to charge more for things that we can create you know, use that revenue to support programs that maybe don't bring in any revenue. Mm-hmm. But, but no, I haven't had a problem with charging um, what you're wor- you know, what I feel I'm worth, and I don't know why that is um, that I haven't had that fear as much as I've seen it in some other people. Yes, and I, it's funny because I don't know if people can sense it, or especially if they know you. I don't think. Because I, I've we've met, and I don't feel that discomfort like it vibes off of other yoga teachers that I've met, where it, they have that internal f- uh, conflict that I it, it, I don't even know how to charge, it, you know, because I'm doing this thing that I love called yoga. Yeah, well, I think some of it though they're getting a message from some of the yoga community that oh, it's a spiritual path. You should just do it because you love it. We do hear that again and again, so that's why I'm even stronger in saying the opposite so that I can give um, our teachers and our students like the courage and the faith that they can charge what they're worth. Absolutely. And, and, and again, it's, I loved your philosophy about uh, I, I, I'm worth it. I'm worth it. And, you know, and there's, t- there's areas where I will make more in this area so I can contribute more in that area. I think there is a flow. I don't think it's all, you know, one or the other. And, and that, the example you gave is a wonderful way to show that there is a, a give and a take that is, is around it. But underneath it all, that belief that, it's okay, and I'm, I, I value my time, and I will be, allow myself to enjoy the money from that is a very important thing to spend some time thinking about and feeling into because you know your truth. The truth is that if you're uncomfortable with it, you're always going to be uncomfortable to get, receiving money, and you're always going to be having a hard time making ends meet, especially doing something you love. Right. I, I also think that if you don't value it, after a few years you start to resent the what people are sort of taking from you, your knowledge and your time, yeah. and then you end up dropping out right. so, uh, and stop, and, or not teaching yoga anymore. So isn't it better to value it and then you're more willing, you know, you're being appreciated, you're being Absolutely. valued, and if you feel valued, it supports you on your path. Excellent. Thank you so much. So we're going to take a break right now. And when we come back, I'm going to ask Lori for her recommendations about, for us, how do we go about doing what we love and how would she recommend starting a business at doing what we love? So stay tuned. Welcome back. And we're talking with Lori Gaspar, a Chief Prosperity Officer, who is, t- who is really giving us so much wonderful information about running a prosperous business. So, Lori, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate all the wisdom that you're sharing and your generous stories. So, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And for our listeners... The pra- Lori is running Prairie Yoga, and it's spelled like that, P-R-A-I-R-I-E, yoga, Y-O-G-A, dot org. If you'd like more information about the teacher trainings or to actually go and take some classes, please feel free to check it out and, of course, and attend anything that you're interested in. So, Lori, here in our last segment, I'm kind of wondering what recommendations or advice would you give to people who, one, want to get involved in doing something that they really love, and two, what advice would you give to entrepreneurs to help their companies be prosperity-focused like we've been talking about? Well, first, I would, in, I would most of all focus on a need Rather than saying, oh, I love yoga, I'm going to open a yoga studio, uh, or I love to knit, I'm going to open a, you know, a yarn store. Um, rather than dreaming and fantasizing about, uh, like, what you'd like to do, what I did was I, I was doing something I loved, but I saw things that, I saw some needs that weren't being met. I saw some things that I wanted to do that I 
I didn't, I couldn't find a place to do them. For instance, I wanted to learn about, you know, the classic texts, and I wanted to learn more advanced, some more advanced um, philosophy and yoga. And I, there wasn't really anybody in the area that I, I was getting that from. So what I, I, so right there, I saw a need, and it was just my need. But my need was not. It's legitimate. That. Yeah, it's a legitimate need. And I thought, well, if I'm feeling this way, there might be other people feeling this way. Um, so rather than like fantasizing about, oh, I'd like to do, you know, I never really dreamed about opening a yoga studio. I never dreamed about or fantasized about it. What I saw was I was doing some, I was working in a way that I loved, you know, but for somebody else. And I saw some things that, that, needed that was that were needed and nobody was doing them and so i filled those holes so i would say my number one advice is rather than just dreaming about something and wanting to do it follow something that you love but find some untapped service or find something that is not being met um so that you can, you know, because if you just do what you love, maybe there may be a millions of other people doing the same thing. And so, you you know, you have a lot of competition where if you find something that's, you know, some little holes in whatever system that, you know, or whatever your interest is, um, I think then you fill that void and there's other people who want it as well. Right. That's, and that's what I teach in, you know, my class at DePaul. I'm like, find a niche, find a thing that no one else is doing. Yes. So that you're, like you said, you're not competing head to head because there's plenty of opportunities out there. You just, like you were in the industry and then you saw. Yeah. So, and it's there. There's niches all over. Um, and I do think also you need, you should work in the industry a little while before you just, you know, like I wouldn't just go to school or go to training and then, oh, open a yoga studio or whatever it is that you wanted to do. It def- I definitely learned a lot from working for other people. I learned what they did really, really well, and I learned what I didn't want to do, you know, some things that I thought I would change. Um, so I learned a lot from that experience. Uh, so, you know, thinking about, you know, just kind of following what you're interested in. I would definitely work for somebody else for a while. doesn't mean that you're stealing their ideas or anything like that. You're just learning by, by actually being in that system. And then you can develop ideas on your own. You can see what is not being met or you can see what works well. And then you can create your own unique business. So number one, filling a need rather than... You know, even when I opened the yoga studio, I had some people say, oh, Lori, is this your dream come true? And I'm like, no, I never dreamed it. <laughs> I never dreamed about opening a yoga studio. But I saw, like with the teacher training business, I saw a need, and I filled that void, and it was successful. And then with the yoga center, I hope to fill a need. I'm trying to fill a void and not just be another yoga studio because there's a lot of yoga studios around, and there's a lot of really good yoga studios around. So I would say that's my number one advice. And then the second question, remind me of what that was again. It, so there's entrepreneurs out there who are in business or wanting to start a business. How would you, what would you recommend them doing around creating a prosperous environment? That one is, uh, well, you do have to, you know, you've got you've to gotta run the numbers. You can't just go in naively. You do have to, you know, I... I hunted down a space to rent. I figured out what I could afford before I signed a lease. I saw how much I was paying other yoga studios to rent their space for our teacher training programs. And I really, I had done that for like two, a little over two, almost three years. So I had two to three years of like data of money. You know, I could see, I could do the math and I could see, well, this is how much I was spending on rent at other yoga studios. You know, and then that kind of gave me a budget to work with for what I could afford to rent a space or not. Um, you know, I, so number one, you can't go into it totally naively. You do have to crunch some numbers. Uh, there's always more cost involved than you think. <laughs> so you need to be prepared for that, whether it's insurance or phone lines or whatever it is. There's always more involved um, than you think. But that shouldn't prevent you from doing, you know, if you see a need, and and you want to fill that need. But you just got to make it work. So, like, I, I'm not going to open a... I knew I wasn't going to open a yoga studio and dump, you know, multiple thousands of dollars in a space that might take many years to pay back, you know. 
um, with really high end things. So I had to find a space that I could afford. I, you know, I put in, I knew I wanted a hardwood floor and it was a lot of money. So I really shopped around and I bought a hardwood floor from a manufacturer that was closing a warehouse, you know. Mm -hmm. So you have to still, you have to dream, you know, I I wouldn't say dream, but you do have to aspire and, and look at, at the big picture and not lose sight of that. But you also need to do the, you do need to look at the numbers. You need to be practical and not naive. You can't be naive and dump a bunch of money into something that might not have a return or might make, you know, take a long time. Or how can I do this but not spend so much money to, to do it? So there's the left brain. Be yeah. logical. What about the heart, the energetic heart of creating a prosperous environment well the other thing is i is to have tremendous integrity and in what you decide to do you know is if you're going to do it then do it the the best that you can and and with an open you know we we're talking about generosity before when one of our when we teach or when i when i teach and, and the message i send to our trainees is you know you Go ahead and, and teach from the heart and give. Don't hold back your knowledge or wisdom. I had one of our, um, someone who went through our teacher training programs who also now comes back and teaches within the teacher training program. She has a specialized knowledge. Once said to me that somebody gave her advice like, oh, don't teach them all that. You're giving away too much, like, like in a workshop. Mm-hmm. And my advice is completely the opposite to her. I said, don't listen to that for a moment. Don't hold short change your students don't don't short change your customers you need to be generous with them so that they will come back and, and, and you know and give them everything that you have uh, of course you have a value to it but there's not an unlimited you don't have unlimited no, or limited knowledge you, you're always like as a yoga teacher or in any other profession you're always learning and growing so feel free to give them or to teach them or, or whatever, provide them the full service that you possibly can at that moment. Uh, and that's what I think is the cool thing, the generous part. That is a prosperous philosophy, and the withhold part comes from a belief in lack and scarcity. Yes. So that just by having an open and generous heart, you're fostering prosperity. You can't not enjoy prosperity when you have that philosophy well love is unlimited if you give your love to somebody else that doesn't mean you have less love for someone else and the same thing with knowledge and wisdom and service there's not a limited amount of it there's a a, you know you can continue to learn you can continue to serve so give it away or or not give it away free but you know be generous with it because you will uh, there's always more to tap into Absolutely. What a beautiful way to wrap up our hour um, with your incredible generosity of being here and sharing your business plan and your ideas. I really very much appreciate it. Thank you. No, thank you, Lori. I've enjoyed it. And if you do want to read more about Prairie Yoga, it's prairieyoga.org, and you can read about Lori Gaspar on her website. Thanks, and have a great week, and live long and prosper. Bye-bye.